Hi, everyone. Uh, it's really, really great to be here. Um, very, very humbled to be uh, talking to this group in particular. And thanks, Jim, for a really, really nice introduction. Um, that's not what I'm going to say. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so uh, what I want to say is I want to talk about open source at Docker, and more specifically, um, how the Linux model of open source helped us at Docker uh, deal with the scale of our open source operations, what we learned in the process. And I'm hoping uh, along the way to extract a few lessons that uh, maybe others can benefit from. So first of all, I want to talk a little bit about what we're trying to do at Docker. And I'm actually not going to talk about containers a whole lot, because uh, I assumed uh, everyone here pretty much knew that Docker does containers. Uh, but I want to talk about why we're doing it and, and kind of what's our purpose. Uh, and it really boils down to one uh, small sentence. We're trying to make the internet programmable. And um, I want to unpack that, because it's, it's kind of a big sentence first. We believe in something we call tools of mass innovation. In other words, we believe that the more people get to create and uh, invent new things and share their inventions with the world, um, the better off society as a whole will be. And we believe that in order to do that, people need tools that are specifically designed to help them create and innovate more uh, and do that at a very large scale. So that's what we mean by tools of mass innovation, and that's what we're trying to, to build. Second, we think there's one, one of those tools of mass innovation in particular that's extremely promising, has a lot of potential to really help uh, make a lot of people create a lot of great stuff in the coming years, and that's the internet, and specifically making the internet programmable. Right? And of course, the internet has been around for a long time, and it's an awesome communication network, but uh, we, we think we're, we're seeing that over the last years it's becoming more than that. It's really becoming a programmable platform. And of course, we've heard the, the, the internet is the computer for a long time, but it's actually becoming true now because there's so many different devices coming online that can do so many incredible different things. And more generally, there's uh, almost every aspect of human society now has uh, a really deep and powerful programming interface uh, to it that's available online to pretty much anybody. And the result is you can create applications that really take advantage of that and operate at the scale of the internet and do amazing things. And we know this already because we consume these applications, right? The, the apps and cloud services that we use every day would not fit in the scope of any single computer anymore. It's, it's almost intuitive and obvious for me to say that. Um, but still building these applications is the privilege of a relatively small number of people in the world. And, and we think it's just too awesome and too important of an invention to be able to program the internet to limit that to a small number of people. So what we're trying to do is make that accessible to more people, um, make it as seamless as possible. So the result, uh, the way we're doing that is by building a stack. And this is a little um, schematic of the Docker stack. It's, it's pretty simple. There's commercial products on top. So we help businesses solve their specific problems using this technology. And the main problem we solve is helping businesses uh, create a, what we call a digital supply chain. So if you're a business and you're creating and distributing applications, you need to uh, have lots of different teams uh, and lots of different systems and locations in the world connected in a pipeline in the same way that for uh, physical goods, you need a worldwide supply chain. The same is true for software. So we help businesses uh, deal with that. And those commercial products are built on top of a development platform, so tools for developers and environments that help um, programmers create and share their applications as seamlessly as possible. And we try to do that both for hobbyists and professionals. And that platform is built on top of an open infrastructure, and that's both codes and standards um, that are developed in the open by a lot of the people in this room, right? Linux is an important part of that uh, infrastructure. And that's the, that's the stuff that's invisible to almost everybody. But really, without it, the internet would, would not work at all, let alone be programmable. And, and so that's infra that infrastructure is extremely important. And we rely a whole lot on it to build our platform. And every opportunity we have to contribute back, we, we take. So the result of all that is a, a product, Docker, that a lot of people use, and still today it's growing pretty fast. And just to give you a sense of the growth, um, I made a little chart. I got some help because I can't design that well. Uh, so in 2014, so what we're measuring here is the number of what we call the pools. So that's the number of containers 
that have been downloaded from a service we call Docker Hub, which is the place where anybody can share and consume containers to assemble in their application. So that number is a good proxy for how many people use Docker and how actively they're using it. So in 2014, we reached a million pulls. 2015, we reached uh, a billion pulls. And this year, in 2016, we passed through uh, six billion pulls. Um, and I think at the moment, we're, we're increasing that number by one billion every six weeks. So that's a lot of containers <laughs> being downloaded by a lot of people. So any, by any reasonable measure, Docker is something that a lot of people use. And so, of course, we ask ourselves a lot the question of, of how did we reach that level of growth? Um, and there's two reasons. The first reason is, selfishly, we want to keep it going, right? We, we think it's good that more people use Docker, and we think we're just getting started. There's a lot of people uh, that could use it for a lot more things. And knowing how we did it in the first place will help us keep it going. And the second reason we want to understand how is so we can share what we learned so that more projects can benefit from, from those lessons and, and grow faster, right? Because we think in the end, like Jim was saying, um, everybody benefits, including us. So one reason... Sorry. Um, the, the main reason we think that Docker has grown at that pace is because of open source. Um, and a lot of people are saying, well, obviously. Uh, and just for, to give context, we're a relatively small company. It's 250 people at Docker. Uh, and when we started, when we launched this current iteration of our project three years ago, it was 30 of us. So a small company with a really big goal. And um, for a company like that, it, it wouldn't be possible at all to achieve our goal without open source. Docker would just not be possible without open source, full stop. And that's because it's just not enough of us to solve all the technical problems we need to solve to make the internet programmable. It's impossible. We, we, there's a lot of smart engineers uh, at Docker, but there's just not enough of them. So with open source, um, we get to s attack these technical problems, share the result of our work with others, and um, and invite everybody else in the community to contribute and reuse and improve these, these components. And as a result, we get to use the results to solve our, our problems, and everybody else gets to reuse the results to solve their problems, and everybody wins. So I'm not going to explain open source to you, but uh, the point is it's really crucial for us, and, and it's crucial also for our growth as a product and as a company. Um, and to give you a sense of the scale of our open source operation, so today uh, we've open sourced about 50 repositories. So that, these are projects, large and small, that we've opened up in the process of building Docker. Uh, about 2,300 people contributed to one of those. And currently, we process 1,200 patches a week. So that's a lot of patches. Uh, we call it the fire hose. It really feels like drinking from a fire hose. And for those of you who are uh, working on Linux, you, you know the feeling. So this is not as large as Linux, but it's closer to Linux than 99% of projects out there. And um, it's just a, a different scale of project from, from most projects. And so when we started dealing with the scale, we had this problem of, OK, how do, we, how do we deal with this? So we had to look for help and examples from successful projects. And of course, the obvious uh, idea was to borrow from Linux. So we ended up using a whole lot of ideas and, and rules and, and tricks from the Linux project. And this is not a complete list, but get, to give you a sense, we borrowed the, the BDFL system, the maintainer system, uh, the release, the combination of relatively rapid time-based releases, um, plus uh, stable interfaces, which allows you to move fast but not break applications as you move, uh, the separation between project maintainer and employer, right? The, the, you have an employer, you're, you have a role in the project. Both are important, but they're, they're separate, and, and it's good that way. So um, there was a whole lot of, of aspects, the, the DCO, the legal framework for protecting contributors, et cetera. We borrowed a lot from Linux, but we also changed quite a few things. And there's one primary change that we made, uh, and the, the resulting model is what we call the Linux model with a twist. And the twist is, it's pretty simple to explain, um, Linux really started with the plumbing, right? Uh, the Linux kernel is a core component, and then as the plumbing improved, different finished products emerged over time to serve, to serve different kinds of users. So we have distros focusing different aspects of what you can build on top of Linux. And with Docker, we, we did it exactly the other way around. We started with the finished product. The goal of Docker is to solve problems for users. 
And then along the way, as we do that, we take opportunities to extract open source components and open them up. Uh, and, and the whole thing is done in the open, but uh, the mindset is very different. And, and in fact, that, that model is closer to what you'll find in large uh, tech consumer companies. So if you think of Apple, Google, Facebook, etc., cetera, um, all these companies have their own users and their own products, and they're laser focused on solving problems for their users. And in the process of doing that, they end up um, they're employing a lot of smart engineers to solve hard problems, which they need to solve. And along the way, they carve out uh, implementations, components, and open that up and invite the community to join. And uh, then the, that open source, that open innovation process kick, kicks off. So that's how you end up with projects like LLVM, Chromium, et cetera. That's the model we're following. So in the process of helping as many uh, the programmers and, and businesses uh, program the internet, we ended up carving out components like libcontainer, swarmkit, notary, and, and 50 more. Uh, so that's, that's the best uh, summary of our model. And if you look at the timeline of that, um, here what you'll see is, is two different things. There's a, there's a few examples of problems we've solved with Docker along the way. So features we added to the product, and at the same time, a timeline of different components we've open sourced. It's not a complete list, but it's the, it should be enough to, to give a general sense. And you'll notice that there's a correlation there. So as we solve different problems, we've had to open source uh, different components along the way. So for example, early on, um, one problem we, we, we had to solve is the problem of container um, provenance, origin. So if you want to deploy containers, you want to know where they come from, and you need some sort of a cryptographic verification of that. And so in, in solving that problem for our users, we ended up implementing a component called Notary, which provides all the primitives for content trust, and we open source that as a separate, loosely coupled component. And now uh, anyone else can build their own platform uh, and using the primitives in Notary. More recently, we introduced built-in orchestration in Docker in the latest version, 1.12, uh, and that solved the problem of a lot of users saying, well, I want to run containers not on one computer at a time, but on a whole swarm of computers. So how do you... Hello? Yep. Okay. Is it something I said? <laughs> uh, how do I do that on a, on a whole swarm of computers, and how do I do that easily out of the box? And so in the process of solving that problem, we ended up open sourcing a component called SwarmKit, which does the same thing. It provides all the primitives and so on. So you get the general idea. Um, so. I want to go into a little bit more detail on that, in that model and take an example. But really, we think uh, this approach of solving user problems first with a finished product, which is Docker, and then open sourcing components along the way, following the Linux model as closely as possible for these components, that's really the key to how so far we've, been man we've, we've managed to keep that, that cycle going that Jim was talking about. So to take an example, um, a little case study, hopefully I won't run out of time, um, one problem this year that we've, we've dealt with a lot is uh, kind of a twin problem from developers and administrators. So uh, it has to do with using Docker with your host platform of choice in a way that feels native. So developers tell us, uh, if I use, for example, a Mac, and you know, replace Mac with your desktop uh, platform of choice. Um, and it doesn't feel native. So I, I use a Mac and I use Docker, but there's a lot of glue I need to put together to make um, storage work properly and networking and, you know, the, the I have to install a separate hypervisor and it's just kind of a pain. I just want to develop on Docker. Uh, can you help me? And uh, on, on the ops side, we get a lot of feedback from, from administrators saying, well, I use this or that cloud platform. In this example, I took AWS, but it's the same thing for every cloud platform. And, um, you know, the same thing. It doesn't integrate natively out of the box with my storage and networking and authentication, and I have to add all this glue, and it just feels like a waste of my time. You know, can you help? So we got that request a lot, and we ended up, um, it ended up on the top of our list, and we looked for a solution. And the result is uh, two products that are in beta currently called Docker for Mac and Docker for AWS. And it's exactly what it sounds like. Uh, it's Docker optimized and adapted to the Mac, and Docker optimized for and adapted to AWS. So it's the same portable experience. You deploy your container-based applications, you manage them, et cetera, with a portable interface. But at the same time, uh, you get to install it, upgrade it, uh, attach it to your storage and networking in a way that, is, that feels very, very native. And so it's not a new feature, but it actually solves um, a, user, a, a problem that a lot of our users have. So, 
This is the moment where I try and give a live demo. <laughs> uh, and I didn't do any offerings to the demo gods, so it may or may not work. But, uh, well, is, is it, can I give a demo? You, you want to see a demo or no? Yes? OK. OK, so let's switch to the computer. How much time do I have? OK. Amazingly, I'm not running out of time. So this is my Mac, and I want to develop on it using Docker. So I'm going to get Docker for Mac, and I'm going to run it. And notice here, I don't know if you can see, but there's a little whale that appears in the menu, and it's uh, kind of moving a little bit to indicate that things are getting set up. And so just to, to explain what's going on here, in this application, it's absolutely everything you need to run Docker on your Mac. Right? There's no separate hypervisor or Linux host you need to install. In this one Mac application, there's a hypervisor, a Linux host uh, integrated in. There's network and storage drivers that, that are designed to hook into the Mac um, system. So basically, you have everything you need. And normally, after having double clicked, all I have to do is open a terminal. And if I type you know, Docker info, I've got a working Docker engine. Um, and if I'm going to run, say, Redis, uh, actually, is this readable? Not really, huh? Better? OK. Well, oh, really big. OK. <laughs> uh, you know, I want to run, run Redis. And here we go, we got Redis running. So I just went from zero to Docker uh, in like 30 seconds. And that, so that's, that's Docker for Mac. And notice there's no bells and whistles, no feature, just easier to use Docker. Um, and uh, so let's say I want to develop my application. So I've got a little test application here. Docker service create. Um, this is really cool. Yeah, this is public, by the way. It's in Docker Hub. It's one of the six billion <laughs> downloads, I guess. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to expose port 80, and I'm going to scale it. Uh, replicas, like 10 replicas. OK, so now I've got a, whoops, a service running. You can see uh, it's scaling to 10 replicas. So now if I open my browser and I go to localhost, I've got my little test application running, and you can see it's serving different requests and different containers, et cetera. So boom, I just went from zero to having Docker and developing an application locally in my Mac, and I, had, I didn't have to do anything. right? So that's the first part of the demo, and it worked. OK, so far, so good. Second part, now I want to use uh, AWS, in my example, to go to production. Uh, and I'm, I've, I have it all set up. I'm, I'm a certified AWS admin. I have my, my account. My spent like weeks setting everything up. Um, and <laughs> It's really simple. And uh, so now I want to create a swarm and deploy this application in production. So what I'm going to do now is there's an optional feature in Docker for Mac, which is really cool, which I use. And you can open that little menu here, and you can say create swarm. And here you can say create swarm on AWS. And so if I do that, it's going to send me to my, um, my uh, console on my familiar Amazon account. And I'm going to choose Frankfurt as a region. That seems appropriate. Uh, and uh, for those of you who are familiar, this is a CloudFormation template. So it's the most native possible way to deploy stuff on, on AWS. And here I can, I can choose you know, the number of nodes, instance size. You know, let's go crazy. Uh, not, not completely crazy, but <laughs> I, can, I can use um, my usual SSH keys. So that's an example of, of tight integration. I, just, I don't have to come up with a completely new authentication system. Uh, and here, optionally, I can register my swarm in Docker Cloud, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain what that means in a minute. So I'm actually, uh, I won't do this here because it takes too long to, to provision a, um, on, on Amazon for this keynote. But um, yes, I acknowledge, creates. OK, so all right, it already exists. I screwed up the name choice. It doesn't matter because uh, I, I actually created one before this presentation. <laughs> Um, but you get the idea. So 10 minutes later, ta-da, I have a swarm, and it's working. Um, <laughs> so then what happens if I go here, uh, so the, the key thing to understand is if I use this, this optional Docker Cloud feature, what happens is all of my swarms uh, call home to a service we maintain called Docker Cloud, which lets me log in and see all of them and, and manage them. So it's connected to team management, so I can say, you have access to this swarm, et cetera. And so the result is uh, once it's up and running, uh, back on my Mac, I can say, OK, my swarm, uh, this is my Berlin demo swarm here that I created just before the presentation. And then what, what it's going to do is connect to it, establish a, a secure tunnel, yada, yada, yada. And then, boom, I have a shell 
And here I have um, access to my swarm remotely. So if I list the nodes here, this is never readable, huh? One second. So here you can see 10 nodes, so that these are 10 EC2 instances with their own IPs in a swarm ready to deploy stuff, right? So from here, uh, I can, let's run the same application. So docker service creates. Actually, I think I did it before. There you go. So same application as I run locally. I'm going to run it here. And now you can see my service scaling, 10, 10 replicas. Now, if I go back to my Amazon, um, uh, my Amazon, <laughs> I'm not actually a certified Amazon admin. That's the problem. <laughs> oh, so many services. OK. OK, this is uh, the one. So if I go here in my very familiar, very simple interface, I can see the, the address of the ELB load balancer that was configured for me. So native Amazon load balancing all set up for me. And if I go to that address, ah, it doesn't work, of course. Oh. Mm. Is it 8080? Damn, it's not working. Oh, wrong region, Frankfurt. OK. <laughs> How much time do I have? OK, we're good. <laughs> Should I keep going? I'm, I'm almost done. Ah. I, mm, it's supposed to expose. Oh, I did 8080 80 to 8080. 80. Okay, okay, let's. Oh, <laughs> I did it the other way around. Okay, it's 80 to 8080. Expose port 80. Okay, anyway. Uh, so, okay. <laughs> cool. So we can switch back to the slides. So you get the idea. I went from zero to Docker on the Mac, Docker on Amazon, and it's all hooked up, and I can start developing and going to production. So it's really simple. It's not new features. Everything you show, the commands, they all existed before, but it actually solved um, a really significant problem for our users. So now to connect that to what we were saying about open source and solving hard technical problems, uh, this is how we explain this feature to our users. You have Amazon. You have a Docker. This is, the, this is the architecture diagram, and it works great together, the end. Now, in, in reality, if you zoom in, it looks more like this. Um, in other words, a really complicated set of technical components. And this is a simplified view, actually. So Amazon itself is a lot of different services, of course, and we integrate with a lot of them. And then on top of that, you need our container engine. Uh, configured in swarm mode, so a way to scale, discover each other, etc. You need a Linux host because EC2 needs an OS to boot, so that needs to be integrated together. You need custom plugins for Amazon storage, Amazon networking, Amazon admin, etc. And then you need infrastructure management. And it turns out that piece was particularly hard because um, what I showed you is actually the easy part. You know, deploying to Amazon, you know, click, click, amazing, I have 10 nodes. The problem is that's the first day, and then you have months and months and years of operations, and you need to keep your infrastructure actually working through upgrades and configuration changes and topology changes and failures and all of that stuff. So you need a component that can keep the infrastructure in the desired state in a way that's both deeply integrated with, in this case, Amazon, but also portable so that we can do the same thing on Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud, IBM, Bluemix, et cetera. And, um, and that's actually hard. You need to be able to do it in a declarative way. Really what you want is a self-healing infrastructure. It just kind of works, and um, you don't have to wake up at 4 in the morning to reboot individual instances. Uh, so it turns out those requirements uh, really added up to something really hard for us to do. And so we ended up having to implement a custom component that could fit in this, uh, in this demo that you saw. So uh, we had to draw pretty deep in our well of engineering talent. Uh, we actually had to acquire a, a, a company to solve this problem. So if some of you might remember, earlier this year, we acquired a company called Conductant. It's a small, a small team of some of the best systems and, and operations experts in the world. They, they help scale. Um, production uh, deployments at Twitter and Zynga and Google and places like that. And for those of you who know Apache Aurora, it's a uh, cluster management system that's in production on tens of thousands of nodes in places like Twitter and Apple. They, they created it. Right? So these are, this is some serious engineering effort that we invested. And the result is a component that helped us solve the problem that we talked about. And following the model I described, 
and we decided, okay, we, we should open source this. And so we actually uh, haven't yet, but we thought now would be a good time to do it. So uh, we can talk about a new component to illustrate our example. So right now we're introducing InfraKit, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's a toolkit to create and manage uh, inf infrastructure that's scalable, self-healing, declarative, and it, it embeds years and years of experience operating real systems at really large scale. So it's really cool. You should check it out. Don't check it out quite yet because it's not open source right now. Um, we actually thought since we're at an open source conference, we could, we could open source something uh, live on stage. So uh, to end this talk, and I'm actually running out of time, do you want to do some live open sourcing? OK. <laughs> so let's go back to. Let's go back to, um, to the computer. So if you go to github.com slash docker slash infrakit. Oh, I have to sign in. And Git was down earlier when I was rehearsing, so but it looks like it's back up. Oh, OK. <laughs> Make sure to enable two-factor authentication. It's really important. OK, so uh, you can go check it out. And so the README is really complete. There's a lot of good examples. Wow, there's a diagram now. Examples. Uh, it's, it's, it's a really neat component. So we, we, if you're into that kind of thing, there's some really cool systems you can build. Uh, OK, so make public. Hmm. Yes, InfraKit. I understand. OK, it's open source. <laughs> cool. So, okay, so I, I'm out of time, and um, so if we can go back to the slides, um, that, that's, that's all I have. So if you're interested in InfraKit or any of the other components that we talked about, all the plumbing, there's a session later today at 12.15. It's called, uh, uh, I think, Deploying Containers Without Docker or something like that. It's, so it's actually Docker engineers and some of the core maintainers of these components showing you how to assemble these features without having to use the whole Docker platform, just using the plumbing. And then if you're interested in Docker for Mac and Docker for Amazon, or you want to you wanna suggest another edition, just you know, check out the website. And uh, yeah, that's it. Come talk to me anytime. I love this stuff. I'd love to talk about it. And uh, enjoy the conference. Okay. Hold on one second. Hold on one second. Oh, Solomon, come on back up. Come on back up. Come on back up. I want to quick ask you a question. So I love the way you described you know, how uh, you're taking products, and then you just open sourced uh, one, which was yeah. super cool. Uh, and then you know those start to go into that feedback loop. So yeah. I, you know, I, I it, it was perfect because you know I hadn't thought of it where you'd you know start instead of starting at the project phase, you start with the product, then you open source the project. I would love to start at the profit phase myself personally, and then go back. Oh yeah. So in a few years, hopefully, we can start with our revenue. And there you go. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Google's got that one nailed, by the yeah, way. That, yeah. <laughs> but we're getting great, there. great talk. And Thank you. for all of you who uh, have ever done something like this, normally developers are not working in front of 2,000 people live on stage. So I thought you nailed it. Thank you. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. All right.